Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. How are we, are we ready for the last Mormon miracle pageant? Yeah. Man, oh man. So I want to talk about that. If you could put the uh, PowerPoint up for me. And my talk today is going to be called Creativity, the Necessary Ingredient to Keep Your Evangelism Cutting Edge and with the subheading, trying different tactics to make evangelism fun. So I'll have these on the board behind me, but on the wall behind me, but first I have to do a little bit of Eastern. Let's do some haikus. You okay with some haikus this morning? Yeah, let's do some haikus. You know what a haiku is? Five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. It does not have to rhyme, okay? I taught English, so this first one is called Finger Licking Good. Here it goes. Susie Oliver. Great Eats in Manti Park. Better than Subway. Those of you who have been to Susie's. Yes, of course. Susie is our master chef. Here's another one. What goes on in there is the title. Temple on the Hill. Sightings of many dead folks. Do not go inside. <laughs> They're true. When I first came to Manti in 1987, we were driving toward Manti from this direction, from Ephraim, and uh, there was a lightning storm. And it was, it was, I mean, it was constant lightning, and it looked like a haunted mansion. I'm not kidding you. My first experience with that in 1987. In fact, here are some of the pictures that my wife has taken over the years of this temple. Um, there's one just in the afternoon, one at night. Um, some say it looks beautiful. I just think it looks eerie. I don't know about you. That's just my personal opinion. Yes. It's not changing. It's not changing. Can you do the pictures for me? Okay. Yeah, here's some, here's some uh, pictures. I, I'm not doing it. They're doing it back there. So uh, there's the pageant right there. That's where the churches are all together. They don't know the truth. And then um, this uh, other one, um, uh, that was that one. So singing in the streets. Here's my next one. We all take a knee. Songs directed to the king. Sounds so glorious. You guys agree with me on that? Those of you who have been out there, we sing before, so that's one of the things we'll get to do. Uh, make sure you're out there. I think we start around six or so, and that's an, a great time. Another one called Hoping. Would you like a tract? Come back once you drop your chairs. I hope they come back. And this is one of those things where they oftentimes will have things in their hands. They're going to have to drop that, but you hope they come back. And sometimes they do, and you get a conversation. Here's another one. This is going to happen here in the next hour, lunchtime. Had Chinese this week. How about Mexican food? A big decision. <laughs> it is. It's the hardest decision probably of the day. Here's another one. Be home by 930. Shake, fries, onion rings. It is so crowded in here. Hang out at Miller's. When you're done, if you're new, you got to go over to Miller's and uh, just follow the crowds. We all go there at 930 when the pageant starts. And then my last haiku for you, missing. Mornings at the church, seeing so many cool folks. You guys, I will miss. And so we'll, yeah, don't cry too much because we have, we have Facebook. We can keep in contact, but... I will miss you guys a lot in, in doing this every year. My verse today that I am going to center around is Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. And it says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. You like that? Now, as, as Chip said, you're not the one who's going to do this. It's, or Actually, it was Rodney. It's going to be uh, the Holy Spirit that's going to uh, win souls. We're only in sales. God's the one that's in production. So that's uh, we have to understand, but you have to be out there planting those seeds. And so I want to talk a little bit, just as my history, in fact, it's interesting that Tim and I are leading off here this year because we probably are the longest going people here. Anybody before 1907 come to the pageant? Anybody at all? 1987? That's when I first came, 1990. Anybody before 1990? 1907. 1907. That shows that I'm old. Together, Tim and I probably have been to this pageant 50 or 60 times. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, this is my 32nd year, although I haven't come every year. I first came in 1987. I uh, decided uh, in 1987 to do some summer work with Youth with a Mission, if you're familiar with that organization. 
And we came here and it was something that we had heard about and it was new. I think some Christians started coming in 1984. I don't know who those people were, but uh, 1987 is when we came. And then I came again in 1989 with my wife. And I've been here almost every year since 1991. That first year, I just want to give you a little idea of what it was like. There were very few of us, maybe a dozen Christians total. And not everybody felt comfortable going out on the street and trying to hand out tracts. And that was a big way that we used to do that. So there would be the crowds that we would have. And it was handing these out and people were taking them. It's amazing. They used to take tracks here, but then they would read the tracks. They'd come back out and they'd start to get a little angry. They'd want to ask questions. You probably remember even in 1990, 91, 92, it still was very contentious out on the streets. But um, what would end up happening is that all the Mormons would want to come around and ask the questions. And so there might have been four or five, 1987, there might have been four or five of us out there and literally a hundred people trying to listen to what you were saying. And I became, I'm not gifted at the street corner preaching, but uh, I, you end up doing that and saying, back up, because they would crush you with trying to hear what you had to say. And then people would start shouting questions. And it was very difficult the first year doing that having people take the tracks, rip them up, throw them in your face. And by the time the pageant started, literally the areas that we were standing was covered with pieces of paper that had been ripped up. So that tells you a little bit of that situation. I've seen pictures of it. I did not have any. I I wrote to Marshall. I know he has pictures. Marshall uh, Almerod was there in the early years. and, And I could not find them to show you this. But I just want you to understand, that's what Manti used to be. Even when I came back in 1989, I missed 88, but 89 I came back, and there were still, there were more Christians in 89, but not that many. And it was very tough out there, very difficult situation. And so one of the things that we did, uh, besides uh, going out there and handing out tracts, we, we, we would go to the park and we would hand out pieces of watermelon to get into conversations. We knocked on doors. I knocked on a lot of doors in Manti in 1987, and I think also in 1989, talking to people who had never even left this area. The furthest they had ever been was uh, Salt Lake City and getting into some good conversations. They had never heard about Christianity. It was an unreached people group, the people who lived in these areas. They didn't have Christians going to pageants or they did not know any Christians, really. There were, there were no churches. There was a little house church in Manti, but a lot of people didn't know about that. We stayed at the Yogi Bear Park, it used to be called, and we would go around to the tracks, handing out tracks in those tents. And so that was uh, how this all started. But over the years, Manti, the Mormon Miracle Pageant, has been awesome for a number of factors. In fact, I have always said that uh, I don't think that we need Manti, or that the people here don't need Manti in the pageant as much as we did, because I think it really grew our own faith. And we took a lot of youth groups over the years. In fact, this next picture, uh, this is a group from uh, 2003. These are students that I taught at Christian High School in El Cajon, California, uh, that came from Shadow Mountain, the same church where David Jeremiah is the pastor, and that's where I was a teacher. I was a Bible department head at that school. And so this was awesome to be able to have these students come and learn how to share their own faith. I had one girl, I'll never forget, she didn't show much uh, fruit in in her Christian walk, but she came to Manti one year, and at the last day she came up to me and she said, Mr. Johnson, I, I am so excited. I have shared my faith for the first time tonight, and it went so well. And I tell you what, that... That just means a lot to me. I choke up right now even thinking about that, that uh, these students would come and do that. Uh, I first brought my daughter, Carissa, my oldest daughter. She was born in 1993. This is a picture of her and I in 2003, um, standing in front of the temple. And this is a letter. This is a letter that she wrote me uh, that same year in 2003. She was nine years of age. This is what the letter said. I know it's hard to see it in the what I, what I uh, uh, copied there from the PDF file, but it says, Dear Daddy, I don't understand what you are doing Mormonism for and what the meaning of it is. Could you please explain it sometime? Love, Carissa. 
Now, isn't that a great question? And I thought I had done things to be able to explain to her why we did what we did. But I wanted to bring her here when she was nine years old. And that's a young age for going out on the streets, although there are, have been kids who have gone out before then. And over the years, Carissa, who now is a teacher, she just finished her second year at a school, Christian school in Fremont, California. And I have some pictures of her and I. In fact, these are all three of my kids, my middle daughter, Janelle, and my youngest, Hannah, who's back here today, um, praying at the end of the worship time on the streets in 2010. So there, there are the four of us. My wife is in the, uh, took the picture. But here's Carissa. I'm kind of emphasizing her because of that note. And um, over the years... Uh, she has had a chance to do a number of evangelism type activities here, and she'll be here next week. So Carissa wanted to make sure she would come. She's getting married in July, so we're very excited about that. It's very expensive, so anybody who has daughters, <laughs> we are taking a collection at the end of this. Or I'll go over the 30 minutes, okay? So, But anyway, my daughter's had uh, um, a great experience here, and when she was... I, I think probably about 19, she came up to me and she said, Dad, I get it. It took her a few years, but she says, I really get it. She really loves the Mormon people. She moved here in, in, when she was uh, 17 after finishing her second year of college and worked for a year at a gym near our home and lived in Utah for a year. She, she did not have the same public school education in Utah as my other two daughters, but she has uh, had a chance to to learn how to share her faith. There's a couple of other pictures from 2015, 2017 with Jamin McKeever. She's tried different strategies throughout the years. Um, I came out with a book that I co-edited with Sean McDowell and a number of people who you're gonna see here these next two weeks participated in that called Sharing the Good News with Mormons. And I remember last year being here and there I am uh, in, in front of the uh, book cover and, and the title that I had there. And um, I wanna read what I wrote in the introduction to this book. And I do have this book, by the way, available on the back table. This is, this is um, uh, what I wrote in the introduction. Evangelism is like fishing. Some use fly rods, many like bait, and still others just put an empty hook at the end of their pole so they can take a nap. When it comes to sharing the Christian faith with others, there are a variety of ways to fish for people. Matthew 4.19. When I walk through a restaurant's buffet line, I don't make a meal of everything offered. On my first go-round, I take samples of a variety of dishes before heading back once I've had a taste of each. Don't become so bogged down by trying to partake in so many of the available dishes that you end up becoming frustrated and not eating anything at all. And uh, that is a big part of who I am. And what a lot of you get to do is the creativity of how you share your faith. There's not one size fits all because what works for some people here is not going to work for others. And that's true with me. Because I have tried some of the tactics that some of you use, and I'm not very good at it. But I'm good at what I like to do, and that's where we need to find our niche. Uh, there are some tips that we can use in corralling our tactics and, and understanding what it is. And first, I'm going to say, uh, not every tactic is going to work for everyone. So understanding that. So, I mean, nobody does, for instance, the impossible gospel better than Keith Walker. And he'll teach on that. And for a lot of people, that works. Other people, it doesn't work. And so if just because it works for Keith doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work for you. But that doesn't mean that there's something out there that could work for you. And that's what that book was all about, sharing the good news with Mormons, to come up with these 24 different chapters of different ways of doing that, to encourage you to try different ways. And even if it doesn't work, it could work for somebody else. Uh, my big strategy is be creative and stretch. Be creative and stretch. Try something that you might not even think would be possible and focus on making your tactic the best it, it can be. Now, I spoke about that last year, and I hope you don't mind, Kenan. I'm going to, uh, where's Kenan at? Right here. Right here. Back there. Yes. Uh, last year, um, I remember the first day of the pageant that you were out there and you were looking and you look kind of shell shocked. I'm just going to say. It was my first yeah. And, and so she's kind of looking around and I was standing over there and I, you know, I got to know her a little bit. And she said, uh, uh, you know, this, I don't know how to do this. I said, well, 
what do you like to do? She says, well, I, I do like to talk to people, but I'm not sure how to do it. So that first day was pretty much all observation. If you're new here today, you have the freedom to observe other people doing it. But then the next day, I remember you coming up to me in the back and saying, hey, Eric, I've got this idea. Do you think it will work? Do you remember that? And, uh, and then I said, well, tell me what the idea is. And so she told it to me. And she says, is that going to work? And I said, I don't know. How are you going to find out? She says, trying it. Okay, go out and try it. So she did. I have a picture somewhere in here. I don't know if I'm going to get to it. But Kenan did a tactic that I couldn't even explain to you. She'll have to explain to you more of having people try to stand up and put their back to a tree. And she'd have candy if they would get to a certain number. And during that time, she started sharing with them. And then she ended up into a whole bunch of conversations with some of these kids who wanted the candy originally, but then ended up talking to her for a half hour, 45 minutes. Guys, it's something like that that just, okay, let me try it and see if that will work. And over the years, I have seen at the Mormon Miracle Pageants lots of Kennans. I have seen lots of different people doing lots of different things that I could never do what Kennan did. And I don't know if she's going to repeat that this year or not. She's going to do the same tactics that she learned about on the street. And she's going to actually be an intern for, uh, for, for Tri Grace this year. That's awesome. She's going to get a chance to do some other things. Yeah. But here's the thing. Fitting outside the box. You're allowed to draw outside the box. It does not have to be done the same way. I don't know if anybody's ever done anything like that. And others of you have done similar things. And that's what I want to use the rest of the time is show you some of the tactics that I have some pictures of that I think are just really cool. This first one is service projects. This is a picture. I don't know if you guys can see. There's young Chip. Young Chip, there's uh, Jamie there. That guy, that old guy there on the right, that's Bill McKeever. <laughs> this guy right here in the front, that's Jimmy Pitts. I, I uh, came with Jimmy Pitts in 1987 and 1989, and his big thing was service projects. So we went and we adopted a family that we had learned in 1987. He came back in 89, and we adopted their family. We painted, we did all these things. And I'm going to tell you, that family who was LDS at the time ended up becoming Christians because of people reaching out. You know, I think it started at Manti with Jimmy Pitts, but I'll tell you, the people at Kaleo, the uh, James Frederick and Tim and uh, the others, they have done these service projects all over San Pete County, and I know they have had an effect on people. So that's a, that's a way that we have reached out to people is service projects. One year, I'm, just, I'm throwing you a whole bunch of different things. This is 2003. Uh, Bill, myself, and Randy Sweet decided to buy a whole bunch of the Navu expositors. We got into some really cool conversations that year by asking people if they wanted the newspaper that ended up in the death of Joseph Smith. And a lot of people had never seen the paper. So we ended up using that. Just, you know, instead of just a regular track, that's what we did. Uh, I thought this was an interesting picture from 2003. Um, the next slide. This is when the church was only about half the size it is right now. And there's a whole group. I don't know if you can see all the faces there, but uh, those are, uh, we started meeting at this church. What year was it, Chip? I don't remember. It was like 2002? 2003. It might be 2003. And this has been really encouraging because we've had actually Latter-day Saints come in and sit in on our meetings. We've had a number of people who have grown not just in learning how to share their faith, but they've heard the gospel here. And so I found this picture. I had to throw it in. 2004, I think it was 2004, the next slide. This is a house that Chip Thompson and Jamie said, hey, we'd like to buy it, but we're not going to buy it unless we buy it with cash. And you know what? God rewarded their crazy idea. Well, I don't know, it, was, it, was, it was six figures. It was a six-figure house. So we all collected money. Everybody sent them money. And within a few months, you had the entire money. You paid cash for this. 45 what are you, days. 45 days. What are you going to do with this house, Chip? Oh, we're going to do some great things, but it's right across the street from the college. I don't know what exactly we're going to do. I don't think you were thinking coffee shop at the time, but you, were, you already were thinking. Okay, so they had all these ideas, and it might have sounded foolish for some people. You want me to buy a house so you can put a coffee shop across the street from a, uni a, a college that is probably 80% LDS, 90%? And That's, they don't drink coffee. They don't drink coffee. But you know what? 
creative. And today that coffee house has been instrumental in people becoming believers, many, many people. God bless you for your faithfulness in doing that. <laughs> Ideas that are outside the box. Drawing outside, that was way outside. I would have never thought of that. And uh, amazing. Another thing that has worked, uh, T-shirts. T-shirts. Some of you are wearing T-shirts. I'm wearing a T-shirt that has my website, themiracleofforgiveness.com, because I'll be out at the street handing out the Miracle of Forgiveness book that I highlight, and I get into more conversations with that, a tactic that I talked about last year when I came and, and did that. But probably the walkers are probably most famous for that. There's a picture of Keith there on the right. Uh, 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 yeah, his, ha his hat as well, the sheriff hat. And, uh, uh, but all these different shirts. There's some shirts that we have some pictures of. In the next slide over, um, we got Rob and Doug over there. They're always famous for, for good t Did you bring some good T-shirts this year? Uh, they always have, they, they like the bright neon stuff. Uh, Ray, I mean, look at Randy's suite. Mormonism equals debt refinance. Biblical Christianity equals debt paid in full. A whole message to whoever you're talking to. People walking by, what, is it, what does it mean about that, Mom? I'm not sure. Well, I don't know. You know, they don't have any idea, but it gives you an opportunity to get into conversations. Uh, this is my daughter, Carissa, with a, sh with a shirt, Are You a Good Person? with on the back. I mean, just different ways of sharing. And some of you wear those shirts well. Another thing that we have done is not the $100 bills, it's the million dollar bills. We kind of stole the concept from uh, Ray Comfort and his group. Uh, and so we have put Joseph Smith on there. We have bills with uh, Spencer Kimball. We have um, Brigham Young. And I'm going to tell you, those bills do work. We have had a number of contacts with people because of those bills. And I would say definitely leave it. If you're going to leave a good tip, leave a, a million-dollar bill in there. And, uh, and so you can see the gentleman on the right corner there. He's reading it. He's reading this bill. And we have had great success uh, with our buddy and Santa that we do out at Temple Square every Christmas. We have a special bill that has uh, Santa and Buddy's picture on. Um, you'd have to go to buddyandsanta.com to be able to see what we do there. But... Um, uh, signage. Uh, some people have done signs where they just uh, they list all these things. I mean, it's not the way that I would do it, but some people have had great conversations. On the left-hand side, you'll see a guy there. He's looking at it. He's reading it. And that's what you want. You want them to interact with what you're trying to do. Another one, uh, Keith Walker did this for a number of years, and we, I just happen to have some good pictures of Keith here, and a street sideline evangelism is what I call it. When things weren't going great and nothing was happening on the street, Keith would go to the sidelines where people were sitting, and you can see, he just gets into a conversation. You've had some pretty good conversations doing that over the years. I don't know if you do it so much anymore, but you used to do that, and so it was just kind of a different way. The uh, cross is a magnet for those of you who have ever had the cross. And my friend Aaron Shafawalaf has used the cross a number of times. Uh, it's a magnet because the cross is not emphasized in a Mormon culture. And it can sometimes get a little bit of heat going. And so you got to be really careful with that. But um, you can see you get uh, people who are, are mockers. Like we have a guy named Bob who comes around and tries to interrupt conversations. And, uh, and so sometimes it can get a little heated, and that's good to have somebody experienced to be able to talk to somebody like that. And even sometimes we call it intercepting. Having one Christian who knows a guy like Bob well enough to move him off to the side so he doesn't interrupt the other people's conversations. That's a strategy, and that has actually been beneficial. This was a year that I actually was doing some of that with uh, Bob. Uh, Bob sitting. I'm sorry? Bob sitting. Yeah, Bob sitting is what it's called. <laughs> This is from 2010. Look at this gal. Uh, this was a conversation that I was not a part of. My wife took these pictures when Aaron had his cross. And you can see some of the emotions. She was quite a trip, my wife said. I don't know if you remember this gal. 2010, she, she was very active. I, we have probably about 80 pictures of you, and, and she just was shooting you like crazy. So I took some of the reactions. But my wife said, at the end... Because of the patience of somebody like Aaron, the next slide here shows you that it ended well, that she's actually smiling. And my wife said her countenance completely changed, and I don't know what you told her, but... How do we know it didn't start like that? It <laughs> only I will know, because I get to be the editor, so uh, yeah. 
But as you're talking to people, you have different reactions. Look at these. This is a, uh, I'm sure, an ironic priesthood group uh, who's listening to Aaron talk. And, uh, and, and you can see the different reactions. One guy's on his phone. Another kid is ignoring. But the adult's listening. He's listening, and there's a conversation that's going on. Uh, another tactic that has worked uh, in 2010, uh, Bill McKeever and his gold plates. You, you all know my friend Bill McKeever. And you can see on this slide here that he used to have it be a handle and weights, and he painted them gold, but that wasn't working out so well. He, he thought he could do better. So the next year, we ended up getting gold metal sheet plates. And that 2011 was the debut of his sheet metal plates. And he has had more conversations with people on a historical issue that has been very bothersome for a number of people. Bringing out these plates, asking them to lift the plates. The plates are 80 pounds in weight, but then asking them how much would gold a sixth of a cubic foot weigh? Well, gold weighs 1,200 pounds per cubic foot. I'm sorry, five, okay, thank you. And so, and so for them to lift these sheet metal plates would be... Um, would be very difficult uh, at 80, and they'd say, well, that's really heavy. Well, that's only, you have to add another stack and another half stack for it to be 200 pounds, because that's how much the gold would have weighed. And so he's had a great success. If you have not seen Bill out on the streets, I highly recommend you see him. Here are some pictures of him talking to people. Uh, one of the things that I've had a chance to do over these last years is I have done a number of videos. I've produced a number of videos on different Christians having conversations. And here I am filming Bill uh, as he's talking to people. So there's something that I have done that's been a little creative. Uh, next slide. Um, if you're an artist and you're, you know, you're going to come out there, well, what if you were to just draw the temple and then allow people to come up and talk to you? And Beth has done that so well over these years. Beth is right over here. Yeah. She, she's been doing this. Are you going to do it again this year, Beth? Yes. She just draws the temple and some Mormons will come over and say, oh, that's so beautiful. And it gives her, I've seen it. I've listened to some of the conversations. She's had great conversations. Uh, Aaron's whiteboard. Uh, he had a friend help him on this year because it kept blowing over. But uh, this is from 2012, and so Aaron decided he was going to try something new, and it worked out great. Another slide from 2014. We, uh, they had just come out with the Gospel Topics essays, and the one that said that he had a magic seer stone, and he put it in a hat, and that's how he actually translated the Book of Mormon. A lot of Mormons didn't know that. I think it was Chip's idea, but they took a table. Translation of the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith's uh, dictation procedure. And so I don't even know who the two guys are. But... David Gaskins, he's going to come on staff with us. Okay, David Gaskins. He forgotten that he did that. <laughs> they put his head in the hat, and he'd come out, and, he would, and so the other guy would write it down like Oliver Cowdery would. I stood by there. In fact, there were some good conversations that you had some chip. I had some good conversations that we intercepted, like you said. There's no curtain. Here's another one. 2014 mini ping pong tournament. Mike Meyer came here. He says, I'm a ping pong player. He says, what can I do? Can I get a ping pong table? I don't know where you get one. So he went to a garage sale and bought a little tiny table. And he made a ping pong table out of it. And so he's a champion, I guess. And so he would play people. And they played a five. And... Whoever got to five first would be the winner. Well, he won most of the matches, but while he's playing, he's witnessing. <laughs> Come on, people. If he can do this, then, then you could too. Well, I'll do my last one and I'll wrap this up. My wife, Terry, decided uh, one year to bring out a sign that said, free seven-minute foot massage. She comes out and rubs people's feet, washes their feet, and then rubs their feet. She did that and had a number of people waiting in line so they could get their feet rubbed. Well, guess what my wife gets to do while they're having their feet rubbed and they're laying back there? She's talking about Jesus. You know, this is what it's all about. One last one, uh, the DVD campaign we did it in 2014. You can go to our website, mrm.org, and uh, it's at the very top. I put it up there for the last two weeks of the, of the pageant, but... Um, uh, here you have uh, a group of people who helped me pass out a thousand DVDs that explained why we do what we do. The whole thing ended with Keith giving the impossible gospel. And, uh, and, and so this is, uh, it was an incredible thing. We put them on every other home all through the city of Manti. Creative things that anybody can do. So I look forward 
to seeing you guys out on the streets. And take the first day off if you have to kind of observe, but find something that works for you. And then just do it like Nike says. God bless you guys.